<clears throat> Get serious now. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter. And today we will be concluding the book of Ephesians. That went fast, huh? Uh, it's it's <laughs> going to be that way for the next several books. Yeah. And before you know it, we're going to be in Hebrews, which will be, I believe that's the low, it is the longest book mm -hmm. between now and Revelation and then Revelation. Wow. Yeah. That's good. And uh, Good information in there. In Ephesians chapter 6, family relationships and spiritual warfare. In chapter 6 of Ephesians, Paul cautions us to be circumspect in our family relationships. Many believers embrace this chapter for its lofty concepts of spiritual warfare, but they tend to leave out the practical demands made upon them that Paul articulates regarding their relationship to their families, relationships to their boss. In this instance, relationship back as even addressing slaves to their masters and masters to their slaves. And, uh, God calls upon us not to be neglectful of our duties in this area, lest our prayers, which he discusses in the latter part of the chapter, lest our prayers fall inert at our feet because we fail to apply ourselves to the whole counsel of God. Nobody prays in a vacuum. Uh, nobody prays or does not pray in a vacuum. The character of your life in Christ has a profound effect upon your prayer life, and your prayer life has a profound effect on your Christian character. Amen. And so we will begin reading the entire chapter, please, Ephesians. <clears throat> chapter 6. Chapter 6, yes. Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I used to say it just like that to my little ones. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God in the heart, with good will, uh, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings, knowing that your master is also. Uh, also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Titus, what's his name? Tychicus. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs, that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. That word sincerity is very interesting. It's the Greek word sincero. And it is actually a term that would be used in a building supply business when someone would go, and back then they built a lot with uh, marble columns, and if someone was going to get some marble columns to build with, the first thing they would ask before making their purchase from the supplier would say would be, are these columns sincere? Mm -hmm. And what it meant was, in those days, when a column was cracked or broken, they would take wax and they would fill it in and daub it with wax to make it look like it was intact. But when you put a load on that column, it would immediately crack and break. And then you try and take it back to the supplier and we say, well, uh, you must have made a mistake in the building process. We, mm -hmm. we just can't help you with that. And so it's talking about uh, upholding, enduring under pressure. And we have to say, oh, I'm a sincere believer. Well, we'll find that out when you're under pressure. After addressing marriage relationships, talking about pressure, in chapter 5, Paul turns his attention to other social transactions. He begins in verse 1 with the admonition to children to obey their parents. The commandment to honor your mother and fathers is the first commandment with promise. He says that it may be well with you and that you will live long on the earth. That word well in the original language means to prosper and be well off. Mm -hmm. Are you prospering? Are you well off? I suggest you do a checkup of your relationship to your parents, even if they're dead. Even if they're not believers, even if you don't have a good, strong relationship with them, the scripture doesn't say honor your mother and father as long as you're happy with them and they measure up to your expectations. No. That's not what it says. You say, well, I'm a product of rape or my father was a really bad person or my mother was horrible. It doesn't make any difference. They were the vessels through whom God uh, transmigrated the eternal seed of your life from Adam right down through your lineage and brought you forth by those parents. And there should be honor bestowed upon them. What about obeying your parents? Um, the Lord told me, he said, you become a man the day that you can hear my voice in, its, in my native tongue. Up until that time, I was 34 years old, and God always spoke to me through the voice of my natural father. When God would talk to me, he sounded like Roy Walden. <laughs> and then one day it changed. And uh, I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but something's changed. What's up? He said, today you've become a man. I will now not speak to you in the voice of your natural father. I will speak to you in my native tongue. And everything shifted for me from that point forward in very radical ways. Listen, you can be 100 years old and your children be in their 80s or in their 70s. They're still your children. That's right. And uh, there is an honor and an obedience uh, that's due to our parents. Uh, this whole idea of I'm you know, 18 years old and I don't have to listen to anybody anymore uh, is not a, a valid, biblically authentic response to proper relationships to our parents or parents Amen. to their children. Uh, I know in my own life, there was a time in my early 30s that I asked the father, what could I do to advantage myself in life beyond what I was experiencing at the time? And he gave me this verse. And from that day on, as an adult, with my own family obligations, I looked for ways to benefit, bless, and honor my parents. And it didn't come without a price. My siblings didn't always understand my attitude toward mom and dad. And they didn't always agree. 
I learned to keep my thoughts toward my mom and dad to myself and just do what God told me to do without suggesting that others do likewise. At first, my parents as well did not understand. Uh, they perceived my uh, expressed intent to be closer to them, to be engaged with their lives as me looking to get something from them. Uh, I wanted to be near to them. I wanted to make myself of service to them, but they were very cautious because my brother next to me, next oldest to me, now deceased, was significantly dependent upon them up into his middle age, and it left their relationship very strained and very awkward. It was a problem for them. It was a problem between them and uh, my middle brother, and I kind of figured that out, and, and I realized it, and so I just bided my time, praying for the Father to give me wisdom on how to proceed. And the day came that I was at the apex of my ministry career. I had pastored two churches, and I'd been promoted to being the number two man in my denomination. And I was being groomed to take over for the founder of my denomination, and to be the head guy over uh, almost a thousand churches and about 1,500 ministers. And in the midst of that, God said, I want you to resign and go serve your father. <laughs> and trust me, that, that really was a challenge to me because uh, I was at that point that decisions I made, I knew would have a profound effect on the trajectory of my career the, as a minister, trajectory of my life personally. And so I, I did. I did what God told me to do. I moved. I moved my family to a very small town where my parents had retired and were speculating in real estate. And uh, I moved. I opened a business. I moved into the back of my business with my family. Uh, nobody was supporting me. Nobody was uh, making it happen for me. I, I went through some very financially brutal times, but also saw many, many major miracles. Mm -hmm. uh, God told me to go down there, and he said, I want you to lay down your life for your parents and serve them in every way possible. I had kids to raise. I had my own obligations. I had the trajectory of my life as I thought I wanted to live it. it was a, and it was a great challenge for me to serve my dad because he was very industrious, even though he, he retired and opened three businesses and bought 26, <laughs> business, uh, 26 pieces of real estate. Yeah. And so I was quite busy. And uh, I, would be, I was running my own business during the day, and I would be gone most nights and working over the weekend to assist him in his affairs many nights, two o'clock in the morning on the backside of rural Missouri uh, in sub-zero temperatures, assisting him coming back from an auto auction. He was, uh, he was involved in, in a car business as well. And, and I'm out there on the backside of nowhere uh, with a, a car helping get it transferred back to the place of business where my father would put that car up for sale. And and it was in addition to that, I was helping my father pastor the, a church. And he didn't pastor the way I would. He didn't do things the way I would do them. And the Lord told me, don't you ever give him your opinion. You figure out what he thinks and you echo that back to him as the recommendation of what you think he should do, even if you totally disagree with him. Mm -hmm. And I suffered great criticism and persecution for doing that. <laughs> And for years at that point, I supported my dad financially, although he didn't need my money. Uh, I would go throughout this little town and uh, into a restaurant with my dad, and I would be walking behind him, and I would hear people more than once say, you see that guy right there? That's the richest man in Windsor, Missouri. Well, he wasn't, but he certainly didn't need my help. But God told me, again, lay down your life. For your dad, at one point, I was giving my father 70% of the profits of my business without being asked. And he really balked at that. But I insisted that he allow me to honor him in this way. 
And right up to the day of their death, these were the things that characterized my relationship to my parents, and I've never regretted it. Amen. Uh, I know in my heart that I would not be in the position of blessing and fulfillment of life that I am at this time without making those sacrificial decisions, and I wouldn't do anything any different. In verse 4, Paul goes on to warn fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Well, that's, you know, when they get up in their early teens, that was my kid's favorite scripture. You know, the thing about it is they get mad about everything. Um, he also instructs that it is the father's responsibility to bring their sons and daughters up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, notice what this verse says, mom and dad. And say, oh, my kids are grown and gone. Doesn't make any difference. Just as in chapter 5, we see it as the husband's job and not the pastor's job to minister to the wife. Likewise, it is the father's responsibility, not the wife, not the pastor, not the children's program at the church to raise your children in the things of God. God's not going to ask a Sunday school teacher or a children's church worker or a youth minister why your kids didn't make it. He's going to hold you accountable for that, Dad. Are you listening to me? And don't go telling me I've got a job. I had two businesses and a ministry that I had to see to. And I laid my life down for my children to fulfill this mandate. In our culture, it's a significant failure on the part of fathers that has contributed greatly to the social decline of our day, the social declension of our day. For my part, this was just an area that I made a determination that I would accept my responsibility to minister to my children and teach them the things of God personally, outside of what I did in ministry as a pastor. It's a mandate in Scripture. Again, this is uh, honoring your mother and father is the first commandment with promise. Abraham, the fact that Abraham taught his children is the only positive reason God ever gave for choosing Abraham to be who he was in the economy of God. Every other reason God gave, it was because Abraham was the least of the least of an absolutely not. He, he was a pagan. He was not somebody that God would have chosen. But the one positive reason that he said he would make good on his promise to Abraham, he said in Genesis eighteen nineteen, I know him. He will teach his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord. Amen. Now, fathers... If you're wondering where the blessing of God is and why God hasn't brought to pass the things that he has promised you, check up on your commitment to your spouse. Check up on your commitment to your children. Again, even as a pastor and a businessman with two businesses, I took the time to instruct my children in the word at home every week and every weekend with what little time I had for myself, little and none. And even when they married and had children themselves, they would come over every weekend with their spouses and they would sit on the furniture. I would get a kitchen chair. I would sit in the middle of the room. When, when they had little babies, I would take those little babies and I would sit them at my feet in their diapers and I would open the word of God. And some of the most profound spiritual transactions I've ever witnessed Amen. was ministering to my family. In that way, and every one of my kids, by all accounts, have an intact relationship with God today. In verse 5, Paul goes on, he says, Servants, be obedient to your masters, and serve them as unto Christ. Uh, I've held a job consistently since I was 12 years old. As I grew to adulthood, I took this verse to heart. I've had many employers who were abusive, dishonest, harsh, and unkind. I served them from the heart as unto Christ. When they would persecute me or pressure me, I would quote this verse to them. I would say, look, if you're not satisfied with what I'm doing, you need to fire me because I'm in violation of this scriptural mandate. In my work history, I consistently rose from entry-level positions to management authority because I followed this scriptural admonition. Amen. 
In summing up his his thoughts toward the Ephesians, Paul reminds them of the warfare the believer faces. But we have to read this. We think, yes, I'm warring against the principalities of political power in world affairs. No, no, no. The whole context of this book and everything he deals with them in terms of negatives in Ephesians is your wife, your husband, your children, your job, your personal uh, uh, morals, your your personal life, the darkness in your own life. Uh, people are out there, they think they're pulling down strongholds and shaping world affairs, and they've got things hidden in their closet that would shame the most veteran believer among us if it became common knowledge. These people were very spiritual. Paul said, much store by them. However, we know from chapter 5, they struggled with deceptiveness. They were liars. They were dishonest. They were, they were involved in theft. They had to be told not to steal. Sexual laxity, filthiness, foolish jesting, etc. Their marriages were not the best. They had to be told. Husbands had to be told to love their wives. Wives had to be told to reverence. Their, you see where the warfare is? You better get the armor of God on you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, and he, he, they, they weren't very good fathers. They weren't very good mothers. He saw how abusive they were to their children. He said, you fathers, you quit provoking your children to wrath. Amen. Can you imagine? <laughs> Look, we all face pressures in life, in family. You want to see a true picture of an apostle? This is it. He gets in your Kool-Aid. He gets up in your fa face in ways that Christians today would not tolerate. But there, but if you do not have an apostle in your life, you are living your Christian life absolutely without foundation. Because it's first apostles, secondarily prophets. Mm -hmm. Paul reminds us this is all about spiritual warfare. And this is the reason why? We should arm ourselves with the full armor of God that we may stand against the wiles of the devil. What, the wiles of the devil out there in some esoteric existential threat? No, I'm talking about the wiles of the devil that make you to, cause you to be a substandard spouse, a substandard husband, a substandard believer, a substandard mother or father. Are you listening to me? We're talking about the pressures of life that arise from how you make a living difficulties in your marriage and child rearing. Hello, you know, difficulties in marriage and child rearing. We're talking about, you know, <laughs> we know one another, right? Temptations to sexual sin. We all look pure as a driven snow when that one gets quoted. Dishonesty, deceptiveness. This is the wrestling of the Christian life. It's not some existential something that doesn't intimately touch our lives. It doesn't get any more personal than this. Yet we often glibly consign these concepts of spiritual struggle as something so far removed from intimate aspects of how we conduct our lives. We feel we're overcoming as believers, but behind the compartmentalization of hypocrisy in our lives and in our thinking, we're bound by darkness, we're bound by self-interest to the detriment of our spouses, our children, and our public testimony. We need spiritual warfare. See, we have to gain the ascendancy there. What's the scripture say in Proverbs? He that ruleth his spirit is better than he that takes a city. How do you defend yourself? By having your loins girded with the truth of God as expressed in scripture. By maintaining a sense of relationship with God, and we're just going through the armor of God here, based on the righteousness of Christ, that we might withstand the constant assault of outside influences working to bring the worst out in us. By maintaining above all the standard of our faith, believing for the best when temptation comes to be in despair and to give in to the dictates of the flesh or our baser nature. By remaining constant in prayer, Always praying with all prayer and supplication for ourselves, for our leaders, whose lives influence us, that we may boldly present the truth with uncompromising transparency. You can't overemphasize the importance of these things, particularly the matter of prayer. When a leader serves a prayerless people, he is not a threat to the enemy 
I don't care how powerful his anointing is, how charismatic his preaching might be, how many smoke machines we've got on the platform. Uh, as for us, we seldom uh, pray for ourselves often as praying for others. In other words, what's the point of praying for somebody else if you haven't prayed through the darkness in your own life? Amen. Prayer is more than warm wishes and kind thoughts. My dad had a habit. Somebody would say, pray for me. He'd grab them right then and right there, mm -hmm. and he'd pray for them. He absolutely refused to, have, oh, okay, I'll think, of more, I'll think a nice thought about you. A strong prayer, prayer life isn't something that can be expressed or encapsulated in a Facebook post. Mm -hmm. Prayer is something for which there is a set time in your day. Did you hear that? Prayer is something for which there is a set time in your day when you put aside everything else and you verbalize in the room your petitions and desires toward God in expectation of an answer. The early Christians were known to greet one another with, do I find you praying? Mm -hmm. Following that example, we close, listen, you don't pray. Under your own roof, you don't pray. And one of the reasons you don't is because you have, an, you have a spouse who's not into prayer. And, you know, they know, they, they know the tepidity. They know the anemic nature of just how spiritually committed you are not because they've never been inconvenienced by your prayer life. <laughs> and if you're not inconveniencing those who are not spiritual giants, those who are not on fire for God, those who do not believe God as you believe God under your household, I question your maturity. And I challenge you, in fact, I command you in the name of Jesus that you set your face like a flint and you determine not by being an ass. Are you listening to me? A lot of people go out and think they're being spiritual by just being asinine in their conduct. But I'm talking about you make it your, your uh, determination to do what they used to call laying hold of the horns of the altar. Amen. And if that inconveniences or makes somebody uncomfortable in your household, then the prayers are doing their job. If you want something different, my brother, if you want something different, my sister, you must do something different. Is, is there not a cause? Mm -hmm. Are we going to sacrifice the well-being of our families, the well-being of our spouse, our children, because we think we have to walk on eggshells and shape our spiritual life around the ideas and the dictates of convenience of those who are not in hot pursuit of God? Are you listening? So we close this chapter. The early Christians were known to greet one another. Do I find you praying? As I close this chapter, I would ask you those same words. Do I find you praying? What does your prayer life look like? Are you praying over those in your household? Are you praying for your spiritual leaders? You have no right to address broader issues. I know people, man, they're addressing the big ticket issues of the earth and their personal life is a train wreck. Their marriage is a train wreck. Can I say to you, my brothers and sisters, can I just, can I just reach out and put my hand on your shoulder and can you and I have a moment of clarity? God has something better for you than that. Amen. And it begins through verbalized prayer. You have no right to occupy your mind with broader issues on the world scene until you have covered your spouse, your children, yourself, your immediate spiritual leaders in prayer. When they falter and fail and you complain and remain prayerless, the responsibility is yours to make the correction in order to have any hope, any hope, and this is what we're after, for things to be different. Listen, some of you have capitulated. You've capitulated and you, you don't have a marriage. You have a detente between two nuclear powers with <laughs> missiles pointed at each other. God has something so much more Amen. than that. You have a strained relationship with your children because they do not demonstrate spiritual hunger in your life and don't respect you because you do. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the true message of the book of Ephesians, 
the true apostolic admonition that Paul the Apostle would stand up from these words and these pages and he would communicate the heart of one who said, I labor and travail until Christ be formed in you. That those things in our lives that have robbed us of that which you paid for on the cross, Jesus, would be uh, resurrected by a faith-filled prayer life by a people for whom the word piety is no longer a religious smear that would go to their knees, that would find the place of prayer and cry out to you until their personal Shiloh is made manifest. We ask that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.